when it comes to your journey to self-love, you don't owe anybody anything. You don't have, no one can dictate to you uh, that you need to love yourself. Welcome to the Conversations with Kai Man Show. I'm your host, Kai Man, and again, this is the Conversations with Kai Man Show. Today, I have with me Cassie Jones McBride. If you guys don't know who Cassie is, she is the founder of the International Fuller Network, as well as the featuring editor for Daily Venus Divas, yeah, yeah. and she is a model. Well, no, no. Not a model. I know a lot of them. Though. You know a lot of them. <laughs> okay, so let's, let's, let's talk about that. Let's talk about that because I'm very interested in that piece of it. Okay. So let's talk about um, the the model piece of it and where that comes from. Well, um, well, I, I do a lot of body positive work. So I started mm -hmm. off um, as many people who want to get into the plus industry, they think that the forward end of that is plus modeling. Mm -hmm. So you don't know of the community, you know of plus fashion. That's the first thing you see. So in 2006, there was a traveling show called Stilettos and Curves. And my girlfriend uh, worked that I worked with, um, she had moved to Maryland. She said, you know, we're having a traveling show. We're coming to Detroit, you should audition. I'm like, eh, it's all right, whatever. So I went and auditioned, and everyone got chosen, basically. Um, but it was my big, my first show ever, and it was at Kobo. So I was just like, oh my gosh. So I, I um, rent space uh, at the lofts downtown, and I practiced, and I had family that flew in. It was a big deal to me. But um, I was working with, because I knew the girl that was part of like the lead um, trainers. Mm -hmm. We would train every other week for a few months and they would fly in to train us. And so, um, working with her, they would try to find another sponsor. I said, well, you know, I can, I go to tour all the time, you go up there and talk to them and see if they'll give us some clothes, whatever, I don't know. So I went up there and uh, they said, sure. So it was like really easy for me to get sponsorship that they've been trying to get for a long time. So I said, well, if I can do that for them, you know, I could do it when they leave, like right. for me, <laughs> and for everybody else. And so, after the show was over, I, I met some lifelong friends that I know who still um, uh, work with me to this day. But they, um, I just started doing events. And one thing after that first show, people would tell me was that they didn't remember what I wore. They just remembered the feeling they got in seeing a reflection of themselves up there. So I'm like, well, I want to invoke that same thing, but I wanted more of an inclusive type of runway. Right. So I started a, a small little production company, and um, we uh, did uh, a few shows, and then I was really into just the behind the scenes. And so I was working with this local uh, design house, and so she made me COO to Nia Monet Couture. So, I was COO, so that was my first title. So um, I learned about uh, this show in Canada called the Fuller Woman Expo. And so I called and um, I spoke to the woman who asked the phone, but I remember she was the person that created the event. And we talked for hours and hours. And I remember um, afterwards I sat in the middle of the floor um, and I was like, I don't know, Jesus, what you have planned for me, but I feel this is on the this is something great, this is bigger than me. So I knew from that point that it was gonna be big. So I was like, okay, so I wanna bring, I, before I even saw what it was, I wanna be prepared to bring the concept of what we discussed on the phone to the U.S. and kind of tailor it, tailor it rather to a U.S. audience. So I went to the, uh, went to the uh, tourist bureau and I got uh, downtown, I got a whole, Layout of what Detroit is with CDs and when they was really doing that stuff that they don't do it anymore. But um, and so I had a whole presentation to present to her to let her know wow. that this is for real. Wow. We're gonna do this. And so I went there and uh, it was I was really impressed. It was the first one, and um, she had I think she had four sh four fashion shows and she had um, little um, segments of uh, 
for Power Mesh, she had guest speakers, and she also had vendors, and so I was like, you know, I really can see how this could work in the U.S., and then we, from that point in 2008, um, decided to bring, I started bring the concept of what that was um, there to the U.S., and so we started in 2009 here. Wow. So we've been doing it here, and now we've expanded to, uh, to uh, Asia and to uh, Africa, and so Canada still does theirs, um, whatever they do, but I kind of run off of the other world. That's awesome. <laughs> that is so dope. That's so dope. Mm -hmm. Tell me, you, you talked a little bit about, um, or you mentioned um, being body positive. Yes. Um, tell me why that's so important. Well, usually when you come into, like, plus, the plus industry is kind of unique in that people come into, the majority of people come into it, um, especially in the African American community is more, you find more fashion focused or fashion initially is the drive toward the community because that's who we are. Mm -hmm. And then um, you find out there's a whole community there. So body positive, um, kind of, what really it started off as fat acceptance and um, fat activism. And so, um, and plus movement and plus positive is how it kind of, well, people have different terms for it, but the terms kind of define the segment of the community that you kind of more identify with. So, like say fat acceptance is um, is really the origins of what the, the, the social justice piece of it is. Mm -hmm. So. Um, fat activism is where you believe that there needs to be um, uh, accessibility for people of size and people who are discriminated against need support and encouragement. People who are marginalized need to have um, access to um, same health care options, you know, no discrimination, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. So it's more of the activism, social justice piece. There's uh, faction, which is, you know, fat. Right. Fashion. So that's basically um, um, just you can wear whatever you want. Um, there's no boxes or anything that defines um, what you shouldn't wear. There's no, no no trend that you can't try, no stripe you can't put on these hips or whatever. So that's more like fashion. Um, there's, then there's a the plus modeling industry, which has a whole standard of um, of a um, business. So it's the business of modeling that's completely different from um, fat fashion or activism in that way when there's um, plus size to start at size eight in the fashion industry wow. and it goes up from there so but it doesn't go up to infinity it stops and it's like a size 16 18 and there's like one or two people who are doing the business of mommy who are larger than that size mm -hmm. but they still those sizes still can't get like the major campaigns or um, not like in-house models. Mm -hmm. So people are tend to you know drawn to those different facets of it. So for me, um, I knew when I wanted to, I was more connected to the feeling the events brought. So I was more into activism. So I really never. The runway is always a, a wonderful thing. I always kind of pull you in, you never, you never, you never want to leave it. It's, it's a good feeling, you know, all the accolades and the, ah, no, it's, it's good, it's addictive. But I knew that my work was, was better served behind the scenes and giving other people that platform. So um, for me, um, having um, a place where people can come and, and I know fashion usually, because our events are like one-on-one -on -one conversations, which, which usually is for most community initiatives are the the one on one on one conversations about the movement in general? Mm -hmm. They believe that fashion is going to be present, so you give them that. But when you got them there, you want to hit them with other stuff, right. like you know what the movement is and what the intersectionality is uh, within the the movement. And, um, and um, for me, uh, which I think is is more is different than other events that go on around the country, is that I'm not solely fashion focused. Um, so there is elements to what we do, of course, that are driven by fashion, but the designers that we choose, we have independent designers. Um, we do 
um, have like brands too that support support us over the years, like Lane Bryant and Elvin mm -hmm. Lee, who always been a uh, strong support of ours. Um, and we've I've had conversations with them when I come to the table, you know, about um, just what I feel um, is a. Uh, is like my position when it comes to the business of fashion and because now like other brands are trying to incorporate the language and the um, movement um, into the, their brands mm -hmm. so the word plus was created by like Bryant back in the early 1900s wow. so they coined the phrase plus for the whole demographic wow. but now we C plus as also um, a way of being and it describes our lifestyle, it describes who we are. It's not just a section of the store and way in the back right. that nobody goes to or it's all unattended and have to, you know, kind of throw or bury through trying to find something cute. It describes a, a people, a community. And so um, now um, other um, brands are starting to, to um, understand that there's a connection to the women that wear the clothes and why they wear it and the reason why they want to have options that um, are catering to um, how they feel mm -hmm. and reflect how they feel. So um, body positivity is, in recent years, has kind of been, um, I wouldn't say co-opted because everybody is beautiful. Everybody should be supported and celebrated and loved and is valued and worthy of all of that. Mm -hmm. But um, when we talk about activism, we want to talk about the marginalized people within that, um, within that community. So you fight for the rights of those marginalized people. So you kind of look at it, look at it as who are suffering the consequences of being who they are. So if they are um, let's say straight size is what they consider outside of plus, anything below the 12s are right. the straight size. So um, if you don't suffer consequences for, for how you look, then the people that are suffering those consequences are the ones you need to advocate for. Right. So I can't go around and um, if I'm a size 5, I'm body positive, I may have my own personal struggles about my own body identity or um, what have you, but um, I don't um, need to give space really for other people who are already doing it, which is um, well, you do need to give they need to give us space in that they don't need to um, kind of make the message or center themselves in the conversation mm -hmm. because it's not about them the smaller people right. or people who don't have the consequences that we suffer. And Michigan is the only state in the country that have laws that protect you against size discrimination wow. and weight discrimination. Wow. It's kind of tied into the racial mm -hmm. code. So um, it's kind of hard to prove just like any other mm -hmm. you know, thing in that area. But it's the only state in the country that has laws that protect it. Wow. Now, how do you pursue it? How do you know when it happens? You know, um, the way I experience my body is different than other people. Mm -hmm. You know, that's where the intersections come from. Um, you have in body positivity, you have to talk about intersectionality. So you have to um, recognize that there are different layers of oppression that you may not experience, but they are valid and worthy of, of uh, support and um, a platform. And so that's what I try to do. And over the years, you know, I've had some missteps like most people have and trying to figure how, um, where I am in the movement and on my own journey to self-love, which is a destination, is not, is a, I mean, a journey, not, not a destination. Right. So you are always on this journey um, to figure it out. And so um, you try to make the right choices, but you always do um, what you can and the voice that you have. And so being authentic and, and doing that um, has been a challenge. So body positivity is layered, but there's a lot of intersection that has to be addressed. Awesome. Well, we're going to take a quick break okay. and we will be right back. 
This is the Conversations with Kai Man Show. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Hello, Detroit, and welcome to the secret society of twisted storytellers, where real people tell true stories live on stage. No notes, no poetry, or Dr. Seuss, just the truth from their lips to your listening hearts and minds. Stories so raw and revealing, so hilarious, human and healing, they will move and inspire you. Take a break from what you usually do. Come out, connect, meet old friends and new every third Friday at the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History. Visit www.secretstorytellers.com to watch videos and for info and tickets today. Elevation Nation Media Group, an entertainment agent for media coverage and access. We create and produce inspired development video and audio content, such as films, short films, documentaries, talk shows, transformational reality shows, radio shows, podcasts, PSAs, commercials, video profiles, and video resumes. Why Elevation Nation Media Group? Because we elevate you by any means necessary. Contact us at www.elevationnationmedia.com. And welcome back to the Conversations with Kai Man Show. I'm your host, Kai Man, and today we are talking with Cassie Jones McBride. Hi. I'm so glad to have you here. It's good to be here. Awesome, awesome, <laughs> awesome. I'm like, I'm gonna have her on the show. Like, I really wanna have her on the show. You talked before the break, you talked a little bit about self-love and it being a journey. Mm -hmm. When did you when did you begin to love yourself or have you always, you know, loved yourself? Well, um, it's like a legacy, my mother and my father, who um, are beautiful people. My mother um, passed away um, two years ago, but they're just, I mean, just beautiful people. And my mother um, always knew of her, of her worth, you know, she came from the South, and so you know, there's a lot of... Um, of course, racial tensions and and um, discrimination that she felt, and um, she, but every like even in high school, she would take a, a picture, the pictures that you take in high school, and she passed them around to other people, even though <laughs> everybody had a yearbook, but she wanted to make sure everybody had the best one that she had, and like throughout her life, she would go and at, for her birthday or when she was feeling good, she'd have her her. Um, selfies basically at uh, the Sears Portrait Studio and she would frame it and it would be our Christmas gift. So we opened up like, oh, you a gift, I'm okay. <laughs> so, you know, I just always knew um, that my, um, that I was worthy, you know, of, of, of love because she always told me that. And I never felt like I was um, different. She didn't make me feel like I was different. I had a stuttering problem when I was really little. And um, she would say, you go into a special class, all these special girls go to. I'm like, really? It was like speech therapy, but <laughs> but it was like, she always made me feel really, really uh, special and loved. So um, I always um, felt that. It wasn't until, there's, there's a few things that you can mark, like in your journey that can say, okay, this is when I start to make a shift. So uh, I was in um, private school. Um, for the first eight years and so I decided, my sister and I decided that we were going to go to public school and that was a shock for mm -hmm. us because never seen so many black people before All right. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> and you know I was really nervous and I was very shy and, um, and so because you know when you are a stutterer too you don't want to say anything, you, you're afraid that you might you know go into it and then you don't really value like your voice that much. So I um, I was afraid to speak a lot. So and then um, so I started to to like see like for the first time all the dynamics you know of high school, all the popular girls and um, so I started to you know, I need to look like them. I was small then, but um, I, was like, I need to look like them. So I started to to develop an eating disorder mm. to where I would just, like I wouldn't, if I would eat, I will just like throw it up or I would eat it all. And I remember coming home one day 
and my stomach was in so much pain and I just hadn't eaten anything and mama knew that she was like you just need to eat sit down here and eat I was like okay that was the end of that <laughs> <laughs> but it took me um it took me a while for her you know for her to talk to me like you know what are you doing mm -hmm. I just want to fit in I just want to be long and but it was and I didn't know anything about bulimia or anything like that but I just knew that I wanted to somehow get to a point where I was invisible kind of and mm. acceptable. So if my curves didn't stand out as much, if I didn't have all of this, then maybe I wouldn't be um, um, liked by the um, guy who also likes the bully in the school. Or, mm. you know, maybe I could just fade into the background. So, um, so that was one instance where I kind of was aware of um, my body and my presence and then as I got older you know I was I really was mama always was fashion for so I always expressed myself through fashion and so uh, when I got older um, I remember when I was in church and this guy there was a designer in church and he was like you know you have a really nice figure and everything but you know you are really you know too thick to be a model you know so but you know, have you ever thought about it? I'm like, well, I guess I, if I did, I couldn't do it. So I'll look at the magazines and, and see what that was. But my, in my mind, I always think that I could never be that. Because he was a designer, so right. of course he knows what he's talking about. I mean, he wasn't a designer, the truth says, but right. what did I know? I didn't know anything. So that was one way. So I knew there was boxes that I had to stay in. There's real um, definitions of what models were and I knew I wasn't it mm. so so those aspirations were gone so then um as I got older I was still self-aware I still liked to you know dress like my mother would do we were um we would be the flashiest or try to be the cutest or whatever and um one day uh, I was talking to a friend of mine and he had called his friend and so he said I'm gonna put you on a three-way and I'm gonna tell him that we're coming. We're gonna ride by. I said, all right, side in the mirror, getting cute and everything. And the guy that he was calling was somebody that I had, you know, known before. I've been over his house before. We was all cool. And so he says, um, so, uh, you know, Cassie's coming with me. He was like, oh, okay. I gotta make room for her. He was like, well, no, we're gonna be not too long. We're just gonna be there for a minute. He said, no, I gotta make room for her. You know, cause you know how big she is. I gotta make sure the tables. I stirred the chairs and sturdy, oh, wow. all of this, and I'm like, I'm listening on the phone, like, <gasps> and I hear him not saying anything either, and I'm not saying anything, and so he's just like, okay, well, I'll just, I'll talk to you later, and so I just hang up, and I'm devastated, like, the first time I realized that people didn't see me the way I saw me, I didn't see me as who I am, I mean, I was cool with you, but you then... Um, took an opportunity to talk about me in such a horrible way and then my friend didn't defend me mm. so I'm like so what is everybody saying like does everybody think this way about me and um, so I was just really I was really devastated for a long time so um, so I realized that um, that I needed to carve my own way I didn't know how it was gonna happen so that's why I went I started um, um, doing this work and then when I found uh, my stride and my voice I realized that um, I will always try to be authentic and start to try to to always speak my truth mm -hmm. and I know I'm not, I'm not gonna always be able to speak for others and I try to give light to those that I can but um, I need to be able to always have integrity in what I do and believe that what I present would be a reflection of me and so I know people are going to say those same things behind my back, but the way I respond is different because mm -hmm. now I see that it's more reflection of their um, their perception of beauty and less of me not being beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> wow! You know what I? I 
it's amazing when you're able to sit down and have a conversation with someone yeah. because you get to um, kind of hear the nuances about their lives and, and things that have happened to them. Mm -hmm. And then you think you hear certain things that have happened to certain people and you think I, I, that has never happened to me. Mm -hmm. And I can't even imagine that happening to anyone. Mm -hmm. um, you know, at, when we're younger and, and we, we we see ourselves, you know, a certain way and then to find out other people see us totally different. Mm -hmm. um, how how does that, you know, how do you carry that mm -hmm. at, at this stage in the game? Do you carry that? Um, is that is that something that, you know, you will forever carry? Mm -hmm. um, and does it d determine how you carry anything else from that point? Well, I'm, <clears throat> I'm more um, socially aware. Like, I know that that um, when I fly, I know there's going to be issues with people who may not want to sit next to me. And I, I anticipate that. So people um, uh, have anxiety about flight. I have anxiety um, when I go on flights. And so you um, worry about, you know, going to how you navigate in your own spaces. You know, you have to worry about people not being um, accommodating, you know, to you. You wonder about, like if um, at concerts, you wonder if am I on the aisle seat or am I gonna be, you know, comfortable. You, um, you go into a workplace, you have to be, um, work extra hard to be more presentable or more of the culture. Um, norm and so you have to first of all you are a black woman so you are um angry mm. and you are um uh, mean but you are also a fat black woman so you're not promotable you're mm. not you know may not even be hireable you're lazy already so there is um the last stigma that comes with it depending on the environment and so it's nothing that you can do to, to fight that. You can't change the culture, but you can change your reaction to it and you can not let it um, try to dictate how you move in your own spaces. And then you just go out and seek other places that support you and that um, and that um, encourage you to be free, to, to be who you are. So that's why the events that I produce, I try to, to foster that, that, um, that environment. Additionally, you know, when you're producing events, you, you want to be able to to pack the house, but you also want to fund it. So you sometimes have a vendor in there, you have a conversation with them, but, you know, they may sell stuff that you tell them not to bring in there because it's not the type of environment mm -hmm. for that, but then you bring it in anyway. You can't help that, and then you may end up offending somebody else. So you want to be able to have an event that is um, all together. A safe space. You want to create safe spaces without whatever you do. So, and it can be to your financial peril to do that, but which it has been. <laughs> but I have to um, to go back to integrity and make sure that what we do, um, I can be proud of afterwards, and I have to worry about the backlash from it. What are What are some of maybe the stories that you've um, heard from other people? Um, of size mm -hmm. um, that you haven't gone through yourself but you yourself thought oh my god like that is mm -hmm. either crazy or that's so hurtful or so mm -hmm. painful have you heard any any stories of that nature I've heard a lot of stories over the years and one thing that I had to learn is to disconnect myself from the initiative mm -hmm. Because if you completely immerse yourself in the initiative, you lose focus of mm. uh, what you have to do, what you're trying to do. Right. So um, I'm not a uh, psychologist, mm -hmm. um, nor do I know all the answers, but I want to be able to, if you come to me and say, you know, I'm really suffering from um, anxiety about flight, I'll, I'll refer them to the flying round flat. The flying, flying while fat um, blog where it has all these helpful links and tips about um, size of the plane, the seats, and the dimensions and everything so you feel comfortable on the flight that you choose. Um, 
I'm a vessel in that way. I can direct you to other places and I can um, help support you in that way. But um, when I hear the stories that are so painful and a lot of the time that we have initiatives um, that are more about how you feel and not about how like what you sell, whatever, because mm -hmm. you can't sell empowerment or right or compassion you have to that's, those are intangible things so when you talk about things that are uh, within you uh, people connect to you and then in turn come to your events mm -hmm. so when I didn't get 500 people or something at my event I'm like initially I was like well they don't want to see me like why didn't they come to support me right. then I had to realize that I need to have an event that they want to be where they want to be supported. Mm -hmm. That it's not about me; it's about them. So, I always welcome the stories, and I hear them, and I and I want to be able to um, give, um, have that shape the way I create the initiative. Because I want to be sensitive to all those stories, so that I can have a safe space. But I have to be able to also distance myself from being too involved in. Um, in the pain of it all because I'm still too being on my own journey. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Well, we're going to take another quick break. Okay. Um, this is the Conversations with Kai Man show. We'll be right back. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back to the Conversations with Kai Man show. We are sitting here talking today with Cassie. And I'm so glad that we had this opportunity. During a break, I was telling you, you know, a lot of times we, you know, we're on our own journey and we don't really, you know, think about other people and what, what they're going through. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's, it's something to be able to be a part of something that you've never been a part of before. And I, I think it would be a great thing for me as a person to kind of like um, come and do something at one of your events, you know, and just to kind of see, you know, the everything that goes on. Mm -hmm. I believe that um, when we begin to like share our stories, because I'm, I'm a real proponent of that, of sharing our stories, because otherwise I'm, I would never know what it is that you've been through. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of times we judge people only because we don't know what other right. people have been through. Mm -hmm. And so um, at your events, you have um, plus size models, you have stories, you have all these different vendors that are there. What are some amazing things that have transpired out of these events? Well, just a connection to the community is what I always get excited about. When I go to other events, I always travel across the country. I'll be um, in Atlanta coming up, speaking there on the panel, and I try to go into spaces where um, I may not be, I may not be expected to speak, mm -hmm. to try to speak my truth there. And so, um, I, I think that. Um, Connecting to the community is what is, is really the highlight for me. But because we have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with a lot of people um, when it comes to the movement, I try to to give them pieces of, of what the movement looks like and try not to be too heavy because mm -hmm. it is still entertainment. Um, but um, given the venue and given um, the, um, the the mission for that year, because we try to have a theme. So last year, you know, I was starting to, when I first came into the to the movement as an activist, a lot of the larger voices did not look like me. They were older, 
um, the National Association of Fat Acceptance started in 1969. Um, a lot of the people that I revere, that I follow and I listen to, are um, started off, you know, in the 80s, early 90s with E-Zines and trying to, but they're learning and they're experiencing and I learn from them, but they don't look like me. So, um, but initially I thought that I had to be seen by them in order for my work to be valid. Mm. So I would um, try to not mimic what they did, but I tried to, to understand what it was they were saying so I can kind of incorporate it in my work. So that as the years went by, um, I realized that I need to pull up from that and I need to speak my own truth, even though the event is for everyone. I need to be able to be authentically um, who I am. Mm -hmm. So last year, I made it a point of being at the uh, Charles H. Wright Museum. Your ticket purchase included the museum tour because I wanted you to experience the journey through blackness mm -hmm. to where I am. And maybe um, if you're not understanding that um, the layer of um, intersection that is the black experience when it comes to body positivity. Um, and it, even if you're not black and you need to be an ally to, to black people. So you do that by understanding what that journey is, giving space to allow them to speak and not center yourself into um, the movement. So um, when I had it there, um, it was, for me, my my identity is very tied to my ancestry. Like I, Frederick Douglass was the most photographed man in the 19th century. Mm -hmm. The very one of the very first things that he did was took a, a selfie, basically. So, but he he understood that. Um, his reflection was important. He wanted to see, people need to see a positive Negro, mm -hmm. you know, and he knew the work. He even talked about in, in, in distant papers about um, back then basically uh, Photoshop and how um, they would uh, alter it to um, make him less um, severe mm -hmm. and, and softer. Mm -hmm. And he bucked against that. He uh, talked about how um, Images are sold and commodified. He, you know, he really understood what that meant and the importance of it. And then, um, so that was the activism. He didn't have anybody else. It was him, and he created um, um, a movement with from him. He didn't know what he was doing. But he knew he had to speak his truth. Mm -hmm. The nearest sojourner truth, who, um, who really is lacking to the current um, uh, bloggers out there, fashion bloggers. Um, she um, toured the country and she uh, made sure that the places that she chose had a photographer that was there. She would create images of herself and um, she made sure that she branded those images with her name and had phrases that said, I sell um, the, uh, um, the, the I think it was I sell the um, the shell for the substance which meant substance that fact which meant that she's shell, she's selling uh, the image to mm -hmm. support the woman that's in the image she was careful about you know the uh, what she wore lacking like her wrap to um, it was always white and it was always um, um, uh, like Susan B. Anthony and others of that time, making more stoic, and, and she was careful about covering her gnarled hand with the wrap that she wore, and she was very careful about that, and she, but she knew the importance and value of her, of her image, you know, changing her name to reflect her own truth. Right, right. And so I'm very, very deeply tied to the legacy of what I am, and even now, like the desired hip to waist ratio as always desired goes back to Sarah Bartman mm -hmm. where she you know was a slave that was um, toured Europe 
well, enslaved throughout Europe. She toured like it was like a right. <laughs> it was on her own, but she had a choice either be in the fields or be you know enslaved in that way. Um, but her waist was very small, her hips were very large, and that was like a well documented case. I think it was like one of the first of where we show the co the, the commodification of the black body, mm -hmm. of how it, it's, its natural state is now um, money. And so um, I wanted people, I don't know if people connected that, I didn't want to be too heavy at the event last year, but I wanted you to, to understand that this body, what it looks like, was sold and devalued. And that if you don't understand like that journey, we come out of that to where we are now mm -hmm. in this space that we've created to celebrate the bodies that we have, there's a deep connection to to the responsibility of showing up um, in the way you want to and not being afraid to be um, limited to anything. So right. having fashion as one of the ways that you um, activate in your life to show that you are um, defiant in, in how you feel you should show up in the world and that's what you do. You may not think that activism like fighting for social justice and and um, uh, safe spaces is what you need to do. But that's okay because you can still come experience um, what we have to offer and kind of get immersed into the the environment. So hopefully that will foster other mm -hmm. thoughts. Um, so when I went to Indonesia, we produced um, the expo in uh, Indonesia and in Bali. And the one thing that they uh, were really concerned with, it wasn't about fashion. We, well, we had a fashion show there. And we had um, some indie designers from Indonesia who also brought in Lane Bryant and Ella Kui, too, to bring some flavor from the U.S. And it was in conjunction with the embassy in, in Indonesia, mm -hmm. the U.S. embassy. It's like a cultural center there that really is uh, geared toward bringing the U.S. culture to that area. And so we um, had a Q&A and the people that stood up were saying, yeah, I just want to know how when I go on a holiday, or I, I'm not uh, invited to holiday because my family won't let me go because I'm plus size. Mm -hmm. How do I deal with that? And how do I deal with when I go to school, people laugh at me and talk to me and make me feel like I don't deserve to be there. Like, how do I deal with that? They wanted real life answers to living. It was not at all about what they wore, you know, so um, that could be a cultural thing or um, it doesn't mean that it's not valued because there was I was another a part of this other show which in Jakarta which is the fashion and food festival which was amazing on the biggest stage I've been on and I dusted off my shoes and got back <laughs> on the runway <laughs> but it was the largest one I've ever been on it was a huge production and it was plus size men and women and it was amazing wow and um, but they cared about that too. But although um, I know that that was accepted, but me as a black woman was like uh, some kind of freak show in some places. Wow. So I would go into the market, I was either loved or hated. Like they would make fun of me, they'll walk behind me, like make fun of me and point and laugh. Or they'll say, oh, you're so beautiful, sit down. You know, they would, it would be either or, it'd be the polar opposite. They get a lot of stares on the point, pointing, and which made me more like, you know, I don't care what you do, right. you know, I'm here. But um, it was very weird to experience that strange dynamic because you didn't know how people were going to accept you. Right. It was very, very severe. So we were in an uh, in, um, elevator. This woman got on, a bunch of us on the elevator. One spoke Indonesian, and the, the two that got on said something out loud and the, the other girl was from Indonesian talked to her. They all got off and so we were all like, oh they were nice, I wonder what they were talking about. And so the girl was like, oh she yelled out in the elevator, why don't you all get on the diet? Oh, wow. And so then she says, these people are models and they dance and they're probably more happier in their lives than you. And so she said, well maybe they're an inspiration. And then she got off the next floor. I thought she was just getting off. Yeah. She's like, no, she's off because she just wanted to be on the 
elevated with us, but they were like in our faces with it. Oh, and we wow. didn't know right. what they were saying. And wow. They didn't know if we knew what we were saying. They just right. said it out loud anyway. So um, it's, it's heartbreaking because Riri, my um, director there, she started her own movement in 2006. So she is really, really focused on the movement there. And she gets frustrated too because, you know, it's still a journey for her. She's still trying to try and make sure that people um, feel loved and supported, but she's doing it alone mm -hmm. too, she feels. But, you know, she has tremendous support. I have a tremendous um, team of people that I work with now that have been with me from the very beginning who understand what this journey has been. And um, it's, it's incredible to see our, our girls together. It's a really amazing thing to see, mm -hmm. but you know you have to stay focused on on the, um, the cause and kind of uh, tailor the message. So I want to bring some of those aspects um, that I learned in Asia to our runway this year. It's kind of hard because I never put a size limit on our model calls, and um, I remember the first year we had these beautiful women. Their size like 26, 28, and they dropped out as soon as they saw nobody else looked like them and I, I've been it's hard to cast um, for larger sizes because they don't feel like we have it and I always have designers who have the range mm -hmm. of sizes um, I never like give the pictures of the models to the designers I give the size only mm -hmm. you fit the sizes and we kind of go from there so I'm very careful about who we select to make sure they don't just give sample sizes on the runway so we try to, to have a range and I want to be able to present differently. You know, we had, last year we had transgender people on the runway. We had someone that was an amputee on the runway. You know, I want to be able to open up um, our runway to more people, um, but also um, not make the mistake of trying to speak for those people either and have right. them be able to speak their own truth. Wow. Well, I um, have noticed here in the U.S., I've noticed um, just on social media alone yeah. that um, there there is a a, a shift, mm -hmm. um, and the shift to me looks like we are more people are becoming more acceptable of plus sizes, mm -hmm. um, and that's only because of when I'm going on social media. And years before, I wouldn't see like certain memes of like plus size people and with positive words behind it. Mm -hmm. And the people that were posting it were not, you know, plus size. Mm -hmm. So when I started looking at that, and I was like, oh, that's cool. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm begin I'm beginning to see that. Um, are you seeing those things, and does that matter? Um, I see it, and it doesn't matter. Um depending on how it's presented, mm -hmm. depending on the um, way they present it, what they speak about when they do. Um, you know, words matter, you know, so they can post a meme and um, be supportive of it, but then they encourage the words that come from other people who don't support the meme, then you're like, well, what's the point? Mm -hmm. You know, um, when you um, share images of a lot of just um, women in general, um, your value is really based on how sexually attractive you are. So if you are, you're beautiful because you are attractive to a man, that's how we kind of quantify everything. This makeup industry is like, you know, you just kind of enhance mm -hmm. all of it to make you beautiful for other people. So um, when you keep that in mind, then all the means that you see is like, okay, so if you're sexy and a BBW, then show a pic in all these groups. Or, you know, you see these women, you know, um, I put these body shamers to shame when I went out there in my bikini and I'm sexy too. And, mm -hmm. and there's nothing wrong with that. You know, selfie activism is a real thing. You absolutely are able to to change the perceptions of people based on how you how confident you are, but um, it doesn't really define um, what is acceptable. 
because so, because people who don't have the same hip to waist ratio and may not be comfortable in a bikini doesn't mean that you are not desirable mm -hmm. or worthy of love and worthy of a meme or anything else mm -hmm. but you don't see that and so you see a lot of the um a lot of the other ones passed around as like you know i'm supportive because look you know she looks beautiful she's hot she's mm -hmm. sexy but that's not what this is about is not how much I'm desired. Right. You know, I need to be able to find spaces where I feel appreciated and not objectified. That's mm -hmm. not what this is about. So you're not supporting me by objectifying me. Mm. Gotcha. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. So it has been my pleasure to sit and, and to have some conversation with you. Yes, I it was amazing. Time. I just learned a lot. And that was <laughs> that's cool. Um, I'm really wanting you to leave us with something mm -hmm. um, that will not only um, carry us into our week of thought, mm -hmm. but something that you we can um, hold on for quite some time. Do you have something to give us? Oh, let's see. Um. I think that when it comes to your journey to self-love, you don't owe anybody anything. You don't have, no one can dictate to you uh, that you need to love yourself. No one can demand um, any, um, any way of thought onto you. You know, it's, it's one thing people throw around a lot is empowerment is more of a catchphrase, mm -hmm. really. You know, I'm just going to empower you. You know, empowerment really is changing the conversation with yourself and with those around you. So I just want um, people to seek spaces where they're supported, where they're loved, where they're appreciated, to um, to support those that support them, who. Um, it's okay to walk out of a situation, even from people who are family, who don't support the way you look or are abusive um, in that way. You need to be able to to find a way um, to um, let them know um, that you're worthy of love and, and, and support and, and encouragement. And the um, events that we produce and the events that you go to that you see um, is not for everybody else. You know, this movement, um, this work, this body positivity or whatever is for you to find your way in the movement. So um, it may not be for everyone. It may not, people may not be able to identify completely with um, your journey because your story is always vastly different. Mm -hmm. But as long as you speak your truth and are aware of the layers of um, other oppression that's out there, um, then I think that um, living the way you want to would be okay, as long as you are aware that there's others that may need support too. And give to other people, you know, live, laugh, love, right. all of that. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. I had You're a good time. You're welcome. You're quite welcome. We'll have to have you come back. Thank I would you love so to. much. I could talk all day. <laughs> <laughs> well, we thank you for watching the Conversations with Kai Man show. Thank you. And good night. <laughs>